You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. Ken Vellante, want to thank you for joining Something Rather Than Nothing. A quick note about a couple upcoming episodes. Uh, very excited to have Matt portray a musician uh, based in Providence, uh, Rhode Island, uh, with uh, his new album, uh, Six Syllables. And also coming up, uh, really excited about this one, Blair Bathory of Fear House, uh, creating horror content and uh, a lot of cool, exciting uh, short film. Blair Bathory, Fear House, coming up soon. In this episode, chat with uh, Mishka Shubali and uh, Super Conversation. We start off this episode where I congratulate uh, Mishka uh, on the day of recording on his 11th year of, uh, of uh, sobriety from, from alcohol. A great accomplishment, and uh, I hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks, man. I had no uh, conception that, you know, when I got sober that like, oh, okay, I'll be sober for 11 years. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, you just sort of put, you try and put as many good days together as you can. And um, I don't, you know, I mean, I feel like uh, the word weird is something that we just sort of apply to everything. So it's, so it has absolutely no meaning at this point, but, uh, but yeah, it's weird to be sober for 11 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd imagine. I'm, uh, I have a uh, uh, 9 9 2009 sobriety date. So, one of the, you know, whatever keeps you sober, one of the strange gifts, weird gifts that, I, that I've had is not wanting to get rid of that date because it's, it's too cool of a date. So, <laughs> whatever it takes, man, to, uh, to, to build that barricade, to shore that barricade up, to, um, you know, and, I, I I think, you know, not wanting to lose a good, uh, you know, a, a sort of uh, visually pretty number like that is as good a reason as any to stay sober, man. Like, it's like really whatever works. I, I completely I completely agree with you. And uh, we'll get into that and talking a bit about, uh, so, you know, sobriety and some of your writing. But before we get into some of that stuff, I um, just wanted to ask you um, – what were, what were you like as as a young child? Were you always entertaining, doing things? What what were you like? I uh, yeah, I mean, I was. Uh, I think I always wanted to be. I I was both shy and I wanted to be the center of attention. Um, you know, I think as you know, a lot of kids are. Um, I uh, you know, I remember being very young and I like you know getting to, you know, to like uh, a family friend's house. And the first thing that I wanted to do was like um, eat a couple brownies and like take my shirt off and run around the house screaming. <laughs> so not much has changed. <laughs> the, uh, but I, I remember too, like, um, you know, people are always doing these sort of like quizzes and stuff like that on Facebook of like, Oh, what was the first artist you saw? And like, you know, who woke you up to, uh, you know, to art or music or whatever. And I, I remember my, um, you know, my parents sort of like just took us kids with them everywhere they went. And I remember probably being like, um, you know, six and we went to dinner somewhere. And then after dinner, there was uh, a student in a wheelchair who got up with his guitar and um, sang and played songs and told, you know, told, uh, you know, jokes and dirty stories in between the songs and, um, and I was just like, man, that is it. That's, that's what I'm going to do right there. Get, get, mom, get me a wheelchair immediately. You know, I need to, <laughs> I need to be this guy. And, um, I really, I have no idea who, who he is or who he was, um, you know, but just sort of like a local songwriter type. Um, but yeah, that, you know, that really sort of changed things for me that, that really opened it up for me. Yeah, and um, and and I know uh, just as as far as uh, seeing and, and listening the material you produced and 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 having followed you, um, there's a huge component of um, 
of storytelling uh, in, in what you do. So it seems like that's kind of like a fundamental uh, component uh, of, of what you do to kind of pull people into the stories with with songs or with with um, uh, your writing. Um, r- regarding regarding uh, art, uh, and obviously that was an influential um, uh, you know uh, experience for you. What type of art? Um, what type of art do you enjoy, or did you start to develop enjoying? Um, you know, like you start listening to a lot of music of particular type and got really into that, or authors. Um, so, what, what do you partake in uh, as as far as art? Um, I mean, I think I, um, you know, early on, I sort of decided that I was going to be a nihilist. You know, maybe you know, being like uh, nine or ten and discovering Guns and Roses. You know, I was like, oh, you know, this is it. You know, every like, you know, parents are just full of shit. And like, um, you know, the world is stupid. And, you know, the only thing that matters is like, you know, girls and guitar and getting fucked up, you know? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, it's so it's taken me a, it, and, and, you know, there's still we we are very much now the the people that we are when we were children you know with you know some few differences there um you know and so i i carry that it's like you know that seed of nihilism fell in my heart at a very young age and put down deep roots you know and so it it, it is difficult for me sometimes to to get out of that and and not just to be like Oh, the art that I like is, you know, married with children or the Ramones or something, you know, the sort of the crassest, most lowbrow stuff possible. Um, but I, um, I was always fortunate to have, uh, smart, fucked up, crazy friends. And, uh, the, a, a friend of mine, Ben Bertocci went on to become a fine artist and, actually runs Jeff Koons art studio now in New York. Oh, wow. And through my, my connection with Ben and my friendship with him, you know, that's been a sort of a great, you know, conduit for me into, uh, into art. Um, because, uh, you you know, Ben is, uh, an effective sort of, um, portal into that world where, um, I remember listening to Guar and Megadeth and like driving around with Ben you know, drinking beer when we were kids. So when he's in a gallery, um, I don't have, there's no, there's less resistance there, um, you know, to go and look at his stuff. And I feel like I have a window into understanding his work through my personal connection to him. And then because I'm friends with him and because I can talk to him about his work and sort of be involved in his work or have a dial, you know, direct dialogue with him about it. Um, art seems less, um, less scary or less, less bougie, less off-putting, you know, um, as, as it might be otherwise. I definitely, I, I definitely, uh, uh, I definitely pick up on that. And I, um, in, in, in talking about, uh, you as, as a writer, I've listened to the, the long run and recently on Audible, um, uh, Cold Turkey, uh, which, you know, I, I, I love that work and I'm going to, I'm going to be real here, Mishka, and, and just, and just lay it out. I, I like, I really like how you interrogated really important questions. Um, you laid stuff out there, you laid up, expose yourself. This is fucked up. Here's how I, here's how I got sober, you know? And I know from what you were saying in the book, it's like, you know, here's these crazy ass experiences. You know, I did this drink and like I was extreme in this type of stuff. But, you know, I stopped I stopped drinking. And, you know, for me, I I look at that type of thing uh, as, you know, whatever works. You know, we we're just talking about that. You know, me getting hung up on the nine, nine, nine sobriety day for me. Good enough. And whatever the program was, AA and outpatient rehab got me sober. But what you do in cold turkey, you're talking about your experiences, and you're talking about this is how I did this. This seems like bullshit to me. This worked for me. This didn't work for me, and this worked for others, and this didn't work for others. And uh, it's a brave stance, and and and, and definitely controversial because we're talking about um, you know rehabilitation uh, or a community where, say, for alcohol, AA is you know the program. So 
what was your experience in, 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 in laying out cold turkey and saying, hey, look, this is how I did it. These are the, some of the things that I put in place and, you know, give it a shot. What was that like for you? Well, I mean, I, you know, I should sort of back up before, um, you know, before answering that question and, you know, say that uh, this isn't a project that I wanted to do. This is um, this is very much a project that I didn't want to do. Um, and Audible approached me about it um, at a time when I was broke. And I was like, yeah, fuck it. I'll do it. I need the money. Um, and thank God they did. Uh, because once I got it, you know, once I engaged the project and once I like really got into it, I, I, I found um, that I had a lot to say about it. And, um, and that it, it was deeply meaningful to me and that I, you know, that I cared a tremendous amount, you know, so I perhaps went into the venture with bad or cynical reasons. Um, but then once I was there, I, I was like, you know, it's like you can make a decision out of bad faith, but then, um, but then you can carry through that decision in good faith, you know, and I, yeah, so I, yeah. like, I, I committed to do this thing. I need to need to do the best damn job that I can. And, um, and I fucking hate self-help and I hate charlatans and snake oil salesmen and pretenders who are like, Oh yeah, sign up for, you know, to, you know, for my book and my DVD for 39 95. And then the, the recurring monthly charge for nine 95 for my seminar. And then you get the tote bag. It's like, fuck all that shit. It's like this profiteering, you know, and it's like, I mean, it's one of the things we see, find that's so despicable right now with the coronavirus that, you know, the um, price gouging and, you know, we find it so repellent when individuals do that. But that's exactly what the pharmaceutical industry does. They find a, a need and then they exploit it as much as they can get away with, you know. And so it was it was really important to me to provide um, to provide the greatest amount of information that I could um, to be a hundred percent honest about my experience and what my author my level of authority is and isn't. And then to just try to give people value for their dollar, man, you know, try to, and that was, that was, you know, a big reason why I was, I'm so grateful to audible, um, you know, for making the, the book free for this month. Um, because, you know, I said, I said point blank in the book, you know, I don't want this to be a, um, you know, the best business is repeat business. I don't want your repeat business. I want you to listen to this book. I want you, I, I want you to be able to use the tools that I lay out there for you. And then I, I want you to never need me again. <laughs> you know, um, right. I don't, there's no guarantee. I don't, it, addiction is incredibly, um, it's, uh, you know, it's like trying to clean up an oil stain in a puddle, you know, I mean, it, oh, it yeah. takes a lot of work. It's very, it's incredibly slippery. Um, but I, I just tried really hard to tell people to download all the information that I had about, um, about addiction, about alcoholism, about getting sober on your own, about recovery. Um, I did give a, a rigorous interrogation of AA and 12 step and that, you know, that culture. Um, I think that, you know, the, the best way you can, you know, I was thinking about this when I was running today, you know, the, um, I, I need my body. I rely on my body. I'm 43. So I don't think I can honestly say that I love my body, but I count <laughs> on it. I need my body to do shit for me. And because I need my, my body to do shit for me, I, um, I work it hard. I test its limits. You know, can, can I do five more pushups? Can I do two more pushups? Can I do one more? Can I, can I, all right, I'm going to run to the stoplight. You know, you, you have to push the, the limits so that, you know, to keep it as fit as possible. And that's the same thing you need to do with democracy. It's the same thing you need to do with art. Same thing you need to do with music. The same thing you need to do with recovery, right? You need to rigorously test the strength of the system. Make sure that it's still working. Um, and it needs to, you know, uh, it's like your computer. You, you have to install the updates. You have to upgrade it, you know. Sure. And I feel like 
um, you know, not to not to attack anyone who's had success in AA or any twelve step program because if it works, it works, man. And if AA has has worked for you, then you don't need me at all. Um, but I I do think that there's um, there's not one solution that works for everybody. So I just wanted to add another voice to um, you know if. If AA didn't work for you, or if if you have a ton of resistance towards AA, then here's another way. Yeah, here's another another direction. I, I you know, I like what you had to say there, and some some deep wisdom and kind of like stretching systems and stretching, you know, w- what we're doing to see if the if the damn things work. And I I, I like that dynamic because it, it demands a lot, you know, you know, on yourself, but on uh, what's around you. My um, uh, and you, and you mentioned running. I um. My, my brother's a runner, and I've known a lot of runners uh, in my life. Now, I haven't been a runner. I've been getting fitter and fitter the best I can. Long walks. I check with my brother for, uh, you know, kind of advice around diet and kind of keeping things up. But um, there's something about runners I really trust, and um, I really uh, think that they have some deep intellectual insight, even though, you know, you think about it, they're, they're just running. Um, what is, what's running done for you? Um, the, I was, I was thinking about this the other day too. And I don't know if this is in response to the question or if it's just an interesting, no, that's fine. Whatever. But, um, I feel like running is like the opposite of sex because when you're having sex, you're, you're intently focused on the one thing, right? You're, sure. you know, you're just totally in the moment obsessed with that thing. Um, when you're running, your body is occupied physically. So if you're, if you're somebody who's always obsessed with working and being efficient and being productive, like I am, then you can, you, you can feel, you can sort of pat yourself on the head and be, you know, I'm being a good boy. I'm doing work. I'm doing a thing, but while you're running, uh, your brain is free to wander. And so it's, you know, it's almost, you know, if you go out running by yourself and you run for two or three or four hours or whatever, you don't have an iPod or an iPhone or whatever with you. It, it is, it's like a forced meditation. Can you imagine like just, just sitting there in a chair with no music, just sitting there with your eyes closed and just thinking for three hours? Like that would, that would never happen, you know? Right, and right. if I knew someone who did shit like that, I would be like, do I need to check in on you, man? Like, are you, okay? <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, so a lot of times, um, you know, I, I running always for me, it's, it's paired with, um, with writing because you write to, you, you get to a point where you're stuck and then you're like, fuck, I can't go any further. I'm going to go for a run. But you're holding in your head the problem, you know, like, uh, you know, she she needs to she wants to walk through the green door, but I need to get her to walk through the pink door. But how do I get her to walk through the pink? door? You <laughs> right, know? Right. And then so if you if you go out for a 15 mile run with that in your head, then for the next three hours, that's the only thing you're going to think about. So. You'll fucking figure it out because you have to, uh, you know, you're just, you're turning it over and over in your head, you know, and, you know, similarly, um, you know, with recovery, you know, um, I will, you know, I'll, I'll go running, you know, running about something that I'm angry about um, or, you know, or that I'm grieving about, you know, the, um, my, if I get into a fight with my sister, she's pissing me off, I'm, man, man fuck her. She's fucking always like this, you know, and then you go out for a run and then you're like, oh, well, I, I mean, I remember when seventh grade when, oh man, I really, I was so horrible to her in seventh grade, you know? And then, so you have, you have a, a, an opportunity to spend uh, a su- su- sustained time with your emotions. Um, but, um, but it's not like you're in a room doing therapy or something like that. So you don't have your hackles up. You know, what you're doing is running. But there's the other thing that happens, which, which all the shit that happens with your brain. It's like, you know, you, you go to sleep and you, you lay down and you rest and that's your primary job. But your secondary job is dreaming, you know. So it, it is like this, you know, this waking dream, you know, a um, 
friend of mine died last week, the ultra runner, Dave Clark and like fucking heartbroken about it. We, 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 we all are, you know, he was an incredible guy. And, um, you know, I, I've just been running through my grief, you know, just take sunglasses so people can't see that you're crying, you know, or go early enough or late enough. There's not a lot of people out on the street and just, and then just carry him with you and just sort through that, you know? Yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm sorry for your loss. And I, I know, you know, I, I, I definitely understand, you know, uh, you know, running, you know, running through that, you have an idea and a kind of a meditation or an ability to think, um, when, when you're running and, you know, and during these times I was wondering, Mishka, um, just about, you know, you're, you're obviously an intelligent guy. You, you think a lot, um, you know, uh, you run, you write, uh, you're an entertainer, you create what, uh, what, what's it been like doing your stuff, doing your creative stuff in a pandemic? Um, it's, uh, actually, you know what? Let me tag one more answer onto your last question. Yeah. Card yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. On. One of the things I, I, I want to say too, that I need to say about running is that as since I was a child, I never understood theism, you know, that I, I just, I remember being like six and walking out onto the driveway and I was wearing my little green running shorts and, you know, and I think I had my skateboard and I looked up at the sky and I was like, nah, there's, there's nothing up there. You know, and I could never understand why people were so attached to this concept of there being a God or there being a, you know, a, a greater wisdom or intelligence or, you know, design up there. Sure. Um, and I always struggled, too, with, um, you know, I have a lot of friends in AA, um, some of my greatest friends. And, you know, they, they're always they're always sort of like trying to get me to understand the concept of higher power, you know, and it's just, you know, it's something bigger than you. And I was like, oh, uh, running, you know, and then the more that I explored my relationship with running, uh, that's I was finally able to sort of understand theism and the, the appeal of that, you know, for, for me to be able to think, um, you know, running is all around me. It surrounds me. And whenever I need it, I can just go out and have a direct line of communication with running. And when, when I need running, I can take as much as I want. I can, I, there's, there's running is limitless. There's, there's no amount of running that I can take from the, the hole that will diminish it. It will always be greater than me. And it will always be surrounding me, even if I'm not currently running at the time, you know, so it, it's, um, on a, a larger sort of cosmic level, um, running, my relationship with running was able to sort of help me parse other folks relationship with God or gods or spirituality or, or, you know, anything like that. And I, th thanks, thanks for bringing, thanks for bringing that in. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that perspective. I don't recall that. And, um, uh, I, I think you're right. I think within the, the, the higher power question within life, you know, but but certainly within AA or th that which is bigger than you or that higher power, I think it's it's it can be tremendously helpful um, for whatever reason you're looking at it. And, and for you to find that that great activity of running where you're connecting, of understanding. I call that for me, I call that like the sublime where something's just bigger than you. You're kind of in like awe and reverence of how big it is. Right. And in and, and my I have I've, I've always had tried to figure out a way of understanding the higher power, understanding what people feel when they go to church. And for me, I have such an emotional connection to beautiful art, particularly paintings. And when I'm in a discussion with a believer, I try to express that is what I believe spirituality is for me. I'm experiencing the sublime. It's impacting me. It's bigger than me. It makes me feel good. It makes me wonder. And, you know, I think people experience that in, in, in different ways. And, um, you know, you, for you, you know, physically and mentally with running, I'm glad you brought that into it. And you felt that when you thought about that or had that experience a bit more, you were able to connect a little bit more with what folks were saying when they're saying AA higher power, what that is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, I mean, it, it, 
ended up being, it, it was a real aha moment, you know, where I, it, it sort of, in that moment, I was able to build a bridge to, um, to the friends and strangers uh, who had had a hard time, you know, understanding um, where they were coming from or what their attachment was. You know, I mean, I, I, um, I still gripe with AA that um, the higher power quickly becomes God and quickly becomes a, a white, a straight white patriarchal, you know, Christian God. Um, because now I'm fucking totally on board with this higher power shit, man. I think it's a great idea. You know, <laughs> I love it, you know, and, and now that, you know, now that I was able to see it through running, I, you know, I, I see it everywhere. You know, I'm my, my sister's old dog. She had this, she had this chocolate lab who was, she was like fat and she smelled bad and she was just such a beautiful animal. And like, I could just, she would just be laying on the floor and I would, I could just look over at her. And the minute that we made eye contact, she would smile at me and her, ta- her tail would <laughs> back on the floor, you know? And if I looked away, like her tail would stop and she would sort of, you know, chill out. And then if I looked at her again, she would just smile at me with her eyes immediately and the tail would start going, you know? And it was just that connection between her and I, you know, and the, the connection between, you know, any person and any dog, you know, that's a, that's another higher power there too, you know? And so it was like, once I was able to see it in running, then I, then I was able to see it everywhere. And, um, and I love it. And like, man, that's got nothing to do with the Bible or church or hellfire and damnation and hating gay people. And I was like, come on, man, like higher power rocks, you know? Um, I, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I definitely know. And I, I I think the word that you mentioned connection there, I kind of like kind of got every once in a while I get floored, you know, by by, you know, hearing certain things. And I heard um, when Russell Brand talk and he was saying that the the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it's connection. Right. And I, I that's why I heard that word connection with you. And at first, like, it's kind of like dropped what I was holding. I'm like, whoa, because so many of us. You know, like in the pandemic, whether we're trying to communicate with people on video or, you know, you're calling up, we're doing a podcast on Skype or like however we're trying to uh, connect. It was, we're craving a connection and there's something profound, um, you know, in that. I, I used to have this experience over and over again with friends in New York where they would be like, well, I've had it, man. I'm, I'm fucking moving to this place out in, you know, Arkansas or the Catskills or whatever. And uh I'm I'm done with New York. I'm done with people. I'm just going to build a cabin. I'm, you know, I'm never coming back. And I would be like, all right. They're like, well, you know, are we going to say goodbye? And I was like, nah, like, <laughs> go, go have fun. You know, <laughs> three months later, they'd be back and they'd be like, man, yeah, I couldn't fucking hack it, man. I'm like, yeah, no, this is the, this is the worst thing about being a human being is we need each other. You know, yeah. and that's one of the things that's so terrifying and so horrifying with the pandemic is that um, we need people. We need each other and not just the fucking pizza delivery guy. You know, we need all the, the different sort of contact and connection that we have with all the, you know, all the different people that we see, you know, during the course of our day. Um, and also. We are the enemy. We are the disease, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not the Russians and it's not China and it's not invaders from Mars. It's the, the invisible boogeyman is, uh, you know, a viral agent that's carried by other human beings. So the very thing that that we need the most, the thing that makes us human um, is also the thing that could make us incredibly sick or cause us to lose our lives or carry, you know, my greatest fear is, um, you know, getting it and not getting particularly sick and then giving it to my mom and then it killing her. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, very, very, very real fears of the, the vulnerability. And I think, I think, you know, what you said is, is really important. Um, hadn't quite thought about it in that way, just in the sense that, yeah, it isn't, there isn't an external, you know, country or planet or, you know, some supernatural aspect to it. It's, uh, it's something that, that human beings are, you know, sharing, uh, yeah, with, with, with each other. Um, 
we're chatting with Mishka Shubali and uh, Mishka. Um, uh, I got a track here that I talked about. Um, wanted to introduce everybody, um, and they might already be familiar with with your music. Um, I, I love your music. I love his style. His the. Um, it, I was trying to describe it to somebody, but I, I like it's you know, kind of like a raw existential storytelling. Um, I really vibed with it. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do was to play um, a track, uh, Destructible, um, and uh, play that now. And then uh, when we get back, we'll, we'll chat a little bit about the, you know, the other iteration of yourself. How's that sound? Sounds great. All right. Farmer John, you've got a lovely daughter. Like blood in the water Shipping fingernail polish Second year of college What secrets does she keep inside her heart-shaped song mishka <laughs> i wish i didn't have to <laughs> <laughs> it's uh uh destructible off uh the album when we were animals correct yeah that's yeah it. yeah it's so funny because it, it accidentally lined up you know perfectly what with what we were talking about you know the so i sort of took an inversion of you know indestructible 
and just said destructible, you know, to talk about human weakness. Sure. You know, and one of the things that I always say out of the gate to my writing students, you know, is that they, they all come in there and, um, you know, I just say, you know, look around, like, no, seriously, look at the other people in the room here with you. We, We've all shit our pants. We've all pissed the bed. We all carry a terrible secret where, you know what I mean? And yeah, this is, and let's not, let's not try to gloss over this. This is what makes us human beings. This is what makes us who we are to keep it secret, to keep it private is to grant it power. And what we're here for is to understand, you know, and it is by going into that stuff and um, is sharing it. I guess it's, sharing that weakness that we all have with each other is what makes us stronger. Yeah. And I, and I, 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 I really vibe with what you're saying there. Is that the, is that the most difficult damn thing to do though? It is, but it, you know, it gets easier. Um, the, in 2001, I, I was shipwrecked and in the process of making out of that misadventure alive, I drank my own urine and my friends fucking love that story. Right. So like, ha ha pee drinker, you know, sure, and, sure. Um, the, it, it does just, you know, it, it, it tickles the child inside each of, you know, each one of us like, ha ha, you drank your pee. <laughs> sure. Sure. And, um, and you know, for a long time I felt like, uh, you know, weird about it and ashamed about it, obviously, you know. Um, and, but then, you know, coming out with that story publicly and, and, and writing about it and publishing that story and, and telling that story. Um, now I'm like, fuck yeah, I did that. In a bad situation, I'm the guy you want in the foxhole with you because I will do what it takes to survive, you know. Um, and it was, it's one of those things, you know, it's like being an alcoholic, you know, I mean, your first year of sobriety or three years or whatever you're, it's just such a like, ugh, weird, awkward, dirty word. I'm an alcoholic, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you just feel like such a piece of shit. And now I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. You know, I, even with that, I've managed to do this and, and from being an alcoholic and from the time that I've spent fucking having to, you know, having to work long hours when I was hung over or having to scramble to find a new job when I got fired from the last one or, you know, finding different ways to eat, to survive, to, to keep moving forward. Um, I, I have a very particular skill set from that now, you know, I'm like the, you know, I'm, I was scared and I am scared about this pandemic shit, but like, I shouldn't be, man, because I was I'm like half cockroach and half coyote. Like I was born yeah. to <laughs> and, uh, you know, born and, and then trained for the end times, you know, to to, to survive. And yeah. you got enough. You got enough stories, Mishka. That I think you just dropped that in there. And it wasn't a metaphor that you were shipwrecked. You were shipwrecked. What the hell happened? Yeah, no, I was fuck. I was literally shipwrecked. Yeah, I uh, I was crewing on a sailboat uh, with friends of the family in uh, 2001 in July, and we ran aground on the uninhabited point of an island in the Bahamas in the middle of the night. And um, you know, the next morning, the captain said, uh, "Well, there's you know, there's a town 25 miles this way. I'm going to go and get help." And I surprised myself by being like, "Nah." Uh, I'm going to do that instead. And you're going to stay here, um, with the boat. Um, and, uh, yeah, I no longer enjoy long walks on the beach. <laughs> <That'll>, <laughs> it that, fucking sucked, man. That'll, it was that'll do it. That was mission and survival based, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wanted to ask, uh, wanted to ask you a question about, um, you know, um, about your, just in general, about your creativity. Have you ever asked yourself why it is that you create songs, write books, create books? What you ever ask yourself why you, why you create? Um, no, I mean, I, I think, 
I think I know now why I do. I think, you know, when I was, um, my mom was huge on the public library, you know, and we would go to the library twice a week, you know, when I was, I was a kid and we would go and, you know, check out as many books as we were allowed and go home and read them all. And, you know, I had a series of little reading lights and headlamps and stuff like that, you know, reading in the car on the way home from the library. And, um, the, uh, so I was like telling, I understood narrative and I was like telling stories, um, you know, from a very young age. And so, you know, initially I was, you know, I, I just make stuff because something pops into my head, you know, like, you know, you, there, you, there's an idea or, or there's a punchline and then you have to like work your way backwards and find out, Oh, what's the setup for that punchline or whatever. Um, <laughs> Last night I was like laying there on the couch and uh, the, the big thing on Twitter of like Karens, you know, of like these sort of privileged white women who are uh, want to talk to a manager and, you know. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. So yeah. and I came up with uh, Karen Abdul-Jabbar and I was like, that, <laughs> that's not anything yet, but one day <laughs> I will <laughs> write a setup. <laughs> It's like it's like Jeopardy. You work, you know, you work backwards from the answers. You know, I was listening. Um, I was listening to Dave Chappelle. Um, he did a Netflix special, and he talked about his fishbowl that he writes the the punchlines in the fishbowl, and then he works backwards from the fishbowl that's in his living room. Um, yeah. Now. Um, uh, one one of the things I wanted to to, to ask, and it's just gonna, is it's like uh, what what this was like. Um, I had mentioned to you, you know, speaking about comedy, and uh, I know you've opened up for uh, Doug Stanhope, who's just a, a fantastic, uh, wild comedian and, and and thinker. What what did you do to open up for Doug Stanhope? Um, the I mean he. <laughs> He famously hates my jokes, hates my, <laughs> you know, just wants me to be a, you know, a, a trained pony and get up there and play my songs and, you know, and then shut my mouth and get off stage, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, Doug, <laughs> Sorry, buddy. um, the, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I just, I got the gig because my, the, you know, the dude at my record label at the time. Um, you know, was like, uh, oh, Stan Hope, you know, tours playing rock clubs and sometimes he brings musicians, you know, out to open up for him. If I can get you that gig, you know, will you do it? I was like, yeah, I mean, of course I'll do it, you know, but like it's it's never going to happen. You know, I mean, how would that ever happen? It's, it's not going to happen. And then uh, and then he fucking stalked Stan Hope until Stan Hope was finally like, OK, <laughs> like he had gotten Doug's phone number somehow. And he was and he, he had Doug on the phone and Doug was like, OK. I'm here. I have the CD in front of me right now. As soon as I hang up the phone with you, I'm going to listen to the CD and then you're never going to call me ever again. <laughs> and, and my friend was like, okay, okay, I get it. That's fine. And then like 20 minutes later, his phone rang and it was Doug and Doug was like, Hey, what's Mishka's phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just, he called me, brought me out on tour with him, man. And, uh, changed my fucking life. You know? So, so it, it might be, uh, Perfect setup guy, perfect fall guy. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> yeah, I definitely felt like I was, you know, his his whipping boy at times that they're out on the road. But you know, I mean, I think it, you know, I think it came from a very um, a very genuine place, for, you know, for him, you know, that like when uh, when we experience something, it, it's like, oh man, you got to try this, you know, or you got to hear this band or you got to see this movie or you got to read this book. Or you got to see this painting or, you know, we, we take so much of our enjoyment um, in this world by, by proxy, you know um, I remember doing a tour with a couple of, of bandmates who hadn't driven through the country endless, you know, an endless number of times and driving through New Mexico, they were like, what the fuck is this place? And I was like, Oh yeah, New Mexico is so weird, man. I fucking love this place, you know. But had I been driving through by myself, I wouldn't have remembered that New Mexico. Sure, was cool. Sure, sure. Um, and you played you played 
you played music, right? I mean, you played played your songs, and uh, did did you try to tell a couple jokes or? Um, well, that's the thing is like when you know when I was first doing stuff with Stan Hope, I was mostly just playing the songs, and then I'd have a, like a little one liner or something like that in between the songs, you know, for going from one to the next. And uh, but then getting getting Stan Hope's blessing, you know, he, his um, he's such a cult figure. And he he cut such a large shadow on underground comedy that then, um, you know, then he was like playing my music on his podcast. And that won me, a, you know, a, a whole new crowd and a much larger crowd. And then those people would invite me to come and perform on their comedy shows. And then, you know, I was performing with a bunch of sort of like open micers. And I remember like seeing them and hearing their jokes and thinking like, man, I'm funnier than this, you know, and for the the longest part, it was just nonfiction. It was just funny or embarrassing stories from my life. And then, um, and then, I, you know, one time I, I wrote a joke and then at a show I was like, all right, fuck it. I'm just going to do this joke. And I did the joke and it fucking killed. And, uh, and I was like, Oh shit. You know, I guess, I, I guess now I'm doing that. Um, and then, yeah, it's a slippery slope, man. Be careful. You could wind up a comedian too. <laughs> hey um uh well and, and and thanks thanks for i mean you know thanks for all all your writing all your work um the 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 jokes the music um just incredible stuff i got a uh, one more question for you and then i kind of want to open up and just kind of let you know folks you know tell folks how to connect to uh all your great stuff but the the big question is why is there something rather than nothing um I think there is something because there is nothing. I um, I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any order to this world. I, th I think the only order that we see is the order that we impose on the world, and so I don't think that. Um, I don't think the world in itself has any intrinsic meaning. I, I think we're just sort of like born onto this ball hurtling through space uh to live and eat and fuck and die and um it doesn't mean anything there's there's nothing inherently meaningful to it however we've been given we've been given we have brains that are too big and too small you know we have brains that are large enough to record every trauma that's ever happened to us it, but brains that aren't big enough to figure out how to release that shit. Um, oh, and so yeah. you just, you sort of carry it with you. And so we find ourselves compelled to, to see meaning or to see an order. Um, and 43 years old, the only, the only way that I've found to make sense of this fucking senseless world is uh is 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 to love to love people to love dogs to love cats to love old guitars um to connect with people you know to um to make a joke with the person making your coffee or whatever or the person you're making coffee for you know try and get people to laugh try and have that you know there be some kind of connection and uh and to make stuff to make something you know, I mean, the um, I think the only response to nothing is something, you know, when you're given a blank chalkboard or a blank canvas or, you know, a hole in the ground, you got to put something in it. You got to put something on it. You have to, you know, uh, even now, if I'm walking by, you know, freshly um uh, freshly poured concrete i'm gonna stop and write something in it you know <laughs> maybe not my initials you know but we have that you know um that spirit yeah so i i mean i think we're just trying to uh we're just trying to make sense of it we're trying to make it mean something and and if we try to make it mean something it means everything dude it's so fucking meaningful yeah uh, th thank thanks for that mishka um, Mishka Shibali, uh, how do folks, how do folks, uh, f find you? Obviously I've hinted, you know, you got some, you got some, you got your music, 
you got you know you got some stuff on Audible. I know there's some stuff on Amazon. Can you just lead listeners to 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 come in contact with your with you and your works? Well, I'm I'm the only Mishka Shabali out there. So if you just if you Google my name, you'll find me everywhere. I'm at Mishka Shabali on Twitter. I'm at Mishka Shabali on Instagram. I um I have like an official page on Facebook and a personal page. Um, the I'm on Spotify. If you search my name on Amazon, you'll find all my um, all my writing. My audiobooks are all on Audible. Um, yeah. Uh, and you're on uh, Bandcamp too, right? Yeah, I'm on Bandcamp. I'm on Spotify, Google Play. Every I have Venmo, Cash App. I have every single way of getting my music to you, and every single way of accepting a tip or a T-shirt sale from a drunken patron in a bar. That's that's that's, that's you survival, gotta, man. <laughs> that's what you gotta do. Um, well, thanks, thanks for that, and and, and I appreciate, you know, I, I mean, and, and I deeply appreciate that, you know, part of the reason I do the program and and reach out to you, Mishka, is that, um, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, obviously about the sobriety, my own personal journey, but um, I, I really like, I really, really enjoy um, your honesty, talking about the human condition, and you know, writing, singing, telling those stories. Uh, doing all these things um, that you do, I just want to let you know that 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 work's important. And I think uh, another component that I like about it is that it it jostles me. And I'm always interested in thinkers and creators who jostle us um, in order to think fresh about it, question things. And um, you certainly do a lot of that. So I, I really I'm I'm just honored that you've uh, spent the time on the something rather than nothing podcast. And I just want to let you know, I really appreciate you and your time. Absolutely, man. My pleasure. Thanks Mishka. And you take care. All right. Take care.